Make Real specializes in creating immersive learning solutions across a range of technologies. To download their latest academic paper on how to turn learners into activists, visit makereal.co.uk slash activists. And we're back. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Hellman. Now, guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. I'm learning. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Welcome back to The Hack Shack. While you were laying on your sun lounger, reading genre fiction, or standing around in queues at airports waiting for cancelled planes, we have spent a blissful summer break here, beavering away to prepare a brand new season of The Learning Hack specifically for you. And also, a new season of our sister podcast, Great Minds on Learning, the first of which airs next Monday. We've lined up a really interesting group of people for you to hear from this season, starting with today's guest, one of the best known and widely respected figures in learning, Kate Fitzgerald, head of fact, with your glowing tan. Give us his bona fides. Hack facts. It's not a glow, it's a hot flush. Dr Nigel Payne is co-presenter of Learning Now TV and From Scratch podcast with Martin Cousins, and has been involved in corporate learning for over 20 years. As head of the BBC's learning and development operation, he led the creation of a new onboarding programme, a leadership scheme for over 6,000 staff, and a state-of-the-art informal learning and knowledge-sharing network. He now runs his own company focused on building more effective workplaces, working with companies in Europe, Brazil, Australia and the United States. He speaks at conferences, leads workshops and is the author of three books. So, Jay Curtis, Head of Themes. Nigel appears on a lot of podcasts and even has his own, but luckily he has interesting things to say on many topics. So what are the themes we focused on in this episode? John, you gave our guests free reign to address two of his biggest bugbears in learning. Firstly, the inward-looking nature of L&D. And secondly, what he sees as a too great a focus on the individual that ignores the organisational context. In an age where technology is driving towards ever more personalised learning, this is a controversial opinion. It certainly is. Later in the series, we'll be looking at adaptive learning, which is of course the most extremely personalised form of technology-enabled learning available. So it's really interesting to get Nigel's perspective on whether this drive towards personalisation is taking us in the right direction. Nigel's is an always active, ever-questioning mind. He only recently completed his PhD, showing a real commitment to lifelong learning. It was great to have this conversation with him that threw up so many original and useful insights. Dr. Nigel Payne, welcome to The Learning Hack. Thank you, John. I'm, of course, an avid listener to and fan of the From Scratch podcast that you present with the great Martin Cousins. Uh, one of the things I always enjoy is where you introduce yourself. So can you do that for us, please? And my name is Nigel Payne. Yeah, for our non-UK listeners, I have to turn joke explainer here for a moment, which is never a good role. This is a very subtle echo of a sort of meme that started with the pop group Madness's 1984 single Michael Caine and was continued by The Fast Show. Uh, Michael Caine himself would, of course, be well known to North American listeners for his many film roles, including a favourite in our house, Scrooge in The Muppet Christmas Carol. But there's this particular English thing. There was a record that had him saying on it, my name is Michael Caine. And I feel that I can attempt the voice because I was born in South London to like him. Sorry about this ramble. It's not completely irrelevant to my first question. Nigel, your long and illustrious career has at times had a lot to do with media. Not only do you podcast and co-present Learning Now TV, uh, you were at one time head of people development for the BBC. So can you tell us how you started your career in learning? What attracted you to it? Perhaps what part media has played in that? And give us a resume of your career to date, if you can. I think the, the emphasis should be on the word long rather than illustrious. 
<laughs> and which is slightly embarrassing. I always used to say, oh, I've been 20 years doing this. The truth is it's more like 30 years, yeah. <laughs> and I like to pretend it's only 20. Uh, I started, um, I got involved in media very, very early on. I, I got uh, um, slightly obsessed by the beginnings of personal computing and the potential of essentially desktop PCs to change the world. And um, when the Macintosh came out in 1984, I couldn't, I couldn't afford one because I was very young, but I was absolutely convinced that that graphic interface, as soon as I saw it, I, I just thought, this is so obvious. Of course you want that kind of virtual desktop on your screen in front of you. And I realized very quickly the potential for helping people learn in a more flexible way. You know, I was doing, I was involved in the early days in doing kind of extension work for universities uh, and others uh, to help people in the community learn. And I realized that tying people to a particular place at a particular time for a particular duration didn't help a lot of people who had families, who had shift work, and who generally just couldn't be Tuesday night at 7.30 for 10 weeks. It was just impossible for them. So I begin, began to package stuff. So very early on, I recognized that if you could package material and in those days, print it and hand it to them and eventually package it electronically and email them and then eventually distribute it in various media and uh, finally distribute it via the internet. There was something very powerful going on. So that's how I, that's how I got into uh, media and technology very early on in, in personal computing. But because I saw it as not as a thing in itself, I was never kind of in love with the technology, but I was in love with the potential of the technology. That's what excited me. And John, believe it or not, all these years later, I'm still <laughs> in love with the potential of the technology. And in many ways, the kinds of predictions I used to make in the 90s, uh, when people laughed at me and said, you're ridiculous, when I said one day we'll have, you know, full screen, full motion video that will be immersive. And people said, that postage stamp, Rachel, that will never be more than a postage stamp mm. on the screen. I got all that right. but. As usual, uh, I, I imagine that everything would happen much faster than it did. And in, so, and in some ways, the internet kind of put us back a bit because the graphics were poor and yeah. the, 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 the transmission rates were weak. So you had to kind of go back a couple of stages in media. But that's all, that's all caught up. So, yeah, so it was a love of learning, a love of trying to help others learn, mar married with a, a, a love and appreciation of the way technology was going to change the world. And indeed it did. What was your first actual job in learning? My first full-time job was to run um, uh, education programs for adults in Dumbartonshire, which is uh, just uh, west of Glasgow. So it's a, a, wow. it was part of Strathclyde region in those days when there was a Strathclyde region. I don't even know whether Dumbartonshire still exists, but it was a, a, a large community, largely largely uh, not an affluent community really, uh, stretching through Clydebank to Dumbarton and out to Bonhill and out towards the mouth of the Clyde. And I only did that sadly for uh, I think two years. And then I moved, my first kind of tech job was I moved into a research role with the what was then called the Scottish Council for Educational Technology. Right. And I did a research project on exactly what I was describing, how we could create analogues of the OU below university level. Uh, so OU, the open, the open university, of course. Yeah. Yes, the, the, the UK, as it's known affectionately in the world, the UK OU, pioneering in the 60s and uh, proving that you could use media, uh, even if it was clunky media, uh, including the GPO, the post office, yeah. to uh, create graduates, to do graduate level, uh, le level education. And what I was looking at was whether you could do that way below uh, university level. And I proved that you could. And then I got involved in the Open Tech program, which started uh, as part of the, that, um, if you like, government manifestation of their desire to improve things below degree level and create uh, technology infrastructures that would allow people to develop their skills. So I was heavily involved with that. And then eventually I became the chief executive of SCET. You know, I, I went in and out and I did 10 years uh, running that technology organization and 
you know, I, I, I kind of threw, maybe people still blame me, but I threw away all the technologies apart from digital technology because I thought there was no point in focusing on anything else. So we, we became a software house and we were the first organization in the UK to be um, bundled by Apple for a, an educational a piece of educational software. And so we sold software and we sold media products and we helped people adjust to the internet. And I did that through to 2000. Mm. And uh, then I'd, I'd kind of, I think I'd, have, I'd had it with Scotland and I uh, wanted to move away. So I came down to London. And I had a number of other technology roles, including a, a very interesting 18 months with uh, Science Year. I ran Science Year with David Putnam as the chair, so um, I worked for David Putnam. The director, producer of Chariots of Fire, of course, yeah. Indeed, the producer of Chariots of Fire and The Killing Fields and many other, uh, many other films. But he, by then, he was kind of right in with the, uh, the Labour government and um, very keen to... Uh, extend educational opportunities and he sponsored science year and i i think it was a a, a success you know we, we we're basically trying to make science and technology cool for young people because it was it was you know there was a massive decline in uptake of science subjects um post 16 in the uk and we tried to turn that around but and we did some funky things we you know i got in the guinness book of records we organized the largest science experiment, simultaneous science experiment in the world. We, we tried to get a million people. We got 970,000, so we failed in that, but we still got the record. And it was called the giant jump. And we got yeah. a million people to jump up and down at the same time. And the idea was to monitor the impact in the Earth's upper crust uh, of that yeah. amount of generation of that amount of energy. And we had seismologists and seismometers monitoring and analyzing what 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 happened and lots of people predicted what would happen and some got it wrong some got it right some people were really afraid thinking we could start a tsunami <laughs> but we didn't we didn't and basically the upper earth's crust proved far more resilient than some people thought it would and the, the energy i think we we created 750,000 tons of energy in 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 a, in that in those 30 seconds but it was it was an interest it was a genuine experiment we we tried to and it it really infused kids no, we got we we sent out um, little packages to primary schools. They could make their own homemade seismometers. So they made these things out of plastic and and cardboard, and they you know they did register a little bit of bit of action. Ugh. So that was fun. And then and then I moved to the BBC after that, and I was in the BBC for five years. So your role at the BBC, if we could talk about that, um, were you with was this you responsible for uh training the people within the organization or did you have part of things like bbc bite size as well no that was uh, that was a different part the, the bbc bite size the kind of education element yeah was uh, handled by a different bit but but we had a role training the industry so we we did a huge amount uh, around globally not not just in the uk mm. uh exp basically sharing our expertise uh, and doing it in a in a very generous way, I thought. I remember once we we um, reproduced the BBC standard English uh, guidelines, which had been out of print for well probably ten or twenty years. So we produced this document on uh, on how to pronounce certain words and grammar and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And we we. I, I made the decision we give it away because I thought we'd get far more publicity than we would by just trying to charge five pounds. I remember I got a, a, an email from CNN, studio director at CNN, saying we've given it to all our journalists and, and everyone who's working with language. You guys are amazing. Fancy giving this away. You're totally crazy, but we appreciate it. So, you know, it, it did go far and wide. I think we got, we got about 75,000 copies of it out around the world. Yeah. So, you know, we, we did, and we did, I remember we did a, a, a good piece of uh, learning on uh, basic camera production. Mm -hmm. And that was really well well thought of as well. Just essentially using BBC experts, BBC directors and producers to describe um, key tricky moments when they were shooting stuff and how they managed to overcome overcome the difficulties. Just, so we, yeah. we gave stuff around, but we were basically focused on um, all BBC staff, all t uh, in those days, 26,000 of them, 
uh, both in front of the camera, behind the camera, and all the other things as well, including ge generic leadership development. We ran the BBC Leadership Programme. So we did everything that the BBC needed its staff to do. And um, we, had a, we had a residential school in Evesham that's still there, Wood Norton, which sat above the, the nuclear bunker, the, the default nuclear broadcast centre if everything went very badly wrong. Yeah. So I was responsible for that. Uh, and that had FM radio, st radio stations. That, that's, that was going to be well, someone's great idea of a, a default broadcasting centre in those days from the 60s. Think, yeah. So um, it was exciting and it was, it was interesting. And of course... We had to get the whole BBC digitised. You know that that most of the uh, the work was analog when, when I came in, and we when I left. It was all it was completely digital. Not just not just me and my team, but we were part of it. We went through the the the, the bombings in London, mm. in which was traumatic. Trying to get my, my team were out on the streets trying to collect video footage because there were no crews. The crews were all out monitoring the, you know, the the Olympics. We just won the Olympics and were out at Heathrow and all these sites where they were going to celebrate the the winning of the Olympic bid. So there were no no crews in central London. So some of my, my camera staff were out there collecting footage for the BBC because there was no footage to start with. Were, at one point, the BBC was running uh, ca police camera footage just as something to put on the screen. Just you know, traffic moving around. Yeah. <laughs> we had to get we had to get real footage. Oh. So yes, we were we were involved uh, deeply in the in the life of the BBC. Or we tried to get involved deeply in the life of the BBC, and uh, and we started with what are the issues and challenges? Not not we've got a lovely course for you. Mm. And can you? Uh, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, the BBC pronunciation. Uh, resources are something that we reference more on this podcast, I think, than anything else, because of course it's global industry, and uh, you know, as a shoestring organisation, we occasionally struggle in which we have those kind of resources. Yeah. Subsequent to the BBC, um, can you kind of fill in up to now, rather briefly? I mean, you've had such a fascinating career, Nigel. All the things you've done have been so interesting. I'm sure we could talk about two hours about all the other stuff, but can you give us kind of a brief scamper to the present from there? I think you and I'd have a great time, John, but the rest of the world <laughs> might be less enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, I started my own company. When I left the BBC, I, I thought I'd try to start my own company and uh, to give myself flexibility. You know, the last year of the, in the BBC was very difficult. There were massive cuts and new chief executive, Mark Thompson. Uh, I was going to lose, well, I did lose lots and lots of staff and lots of lots of budget. And um, I found it, uh, you know, you can do it, but I found making people redundant day in, day out for months uh, extremely harrowing and not really what I thought my life was about. <laughs> so when I left, uh, I, I, rather than just immediately jump into a new job, I thought I'd try and take control of my own life a bit more. So I started my own company, which I probably unimaginatively called NigelPayne.com Limited. And um, what happened was I got involved with a doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, initially on the advisory board, and now I'm an academic director. So I, I'm, th that became a really deep uh, and continuing uh, um, role for me, helping those, uh, those people, uh, the students, get their doctorates. And uh, it's called the CLO program, so it's aimed at people operating at high level uh, in organizations in learning and talent. And it's morphed, but it's still very, very doing very well. And I got to, you know, I got to travel. I, you know, I went everywhere. I got picked up by the United Nations. I was in Libya. You know, I, I, I was in Egypt. Um, I was in all sorts of countries. I still work in the Middle East, in, in um, Oman, in Kuwait, and in Qatar. Uh, and I, I, I got to spend a lot of time in the United States, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So I, I, I went crazy in a way from being very much confined to base in the last bit of the BBC just to get involved in the world. And so I did a lot of work in um, mainland Europe and, and really enjoyed that engagement. And it, it also gave me a real understanding of what was actually going on in organisations everywhere, not just what was going on in my own little you know, bubble of London. 
and uh, and I've continued that. And I started writing at uh, at some point. I got invited to write one book that became a three book deal. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wrote three books in five years. But again, I was terrified that I, I would fail. So I I tried to give back the initial advance, and they wouldn't take it. Because they said, you know, the reason we give you an advance is to make sure you deliver the book. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. But I managed to. Yeah. So I did that. Uh, so I did. I wrote three books and I got involved in my own research. I got my doctorate uh, and um, and I've continued to work with organizations all over the world. You know, I've got I'm working very closely with an organization in New Zealand, for example. I've worked in Australia and uh, as well as Europe, the UK and the US. So I've, I, I think I've had a really interesting life. I've, I'm fascinated by the people that I meet. I love my students on the doctoral program. That's what keeps me going, really, is the, because they're all senior people and they're, they're battling, com, coming up against some really tricky problems as the organizations evolve and the role of learning and development evolves. So a lot of my, my ideas and my beliefs come from that engagement in the world. I'm not really an academic. I'm a, I suppose I'm a failed academic, if anything, because I just, you know, I just can't extract myself from the world long enough to to be disconnected and to, to focus on research. But I couldn't live without research. So I, I call I call myself as we we try to call the students in Penn scholar practitioners. I want I believe in scholarship. I believe in research. I believe in evidence. But at the same time, I'm, I feel that I'm a practitioner. I get my hands dirty. I work in the real world as well. And I find that combination very, very powerful. But that, that may be that may, may be just me, John. <laughs> no one else agrees with me. A lot of modesty coming across there, but not much failure. So from that lifetime of learning now for, for the rest of what remains of the interview, I'd like to explore a bit of what that experience has told you. Uh, about learning, especially in the organizational contents, context, um, you know, and what is exciting you, irritating you, worrying you currently now based on, on that experience. Firstly, one thing you've said is that you think L&D is too inward looking, um, too introspective. Why do you say that? And what do you think the reasons are for it? I think the reason I think it's had a tendency to disconnect itself from the the the, the business life and ebb and flow of the organisation in order to produce stuff, courses, content, or whatever. And in some ways, I, the, the, the technology revolution has encouraged that. You know, there are companies who tell you that if you are in L and D and you focus on our product, our solutions, that's the job done. And that encourages, I think, that that feeds into that. We are self-contained. We produce these great services for the rest of the organization. And therefore, you tend to huddle inwardly. And all those people who spend their time evaluating their own content to make sure that everyone loves it, that's all inward looking and has had, has no real reference to the outside world. What, what I encourage uh, and what I think the world demands is outward facing uh, L&D. So it doesn't start with the, the solution. It doesn't say, John, every problem needs a course. Tell me your problem and I'll find you the right, the right course. Outward looking L&D says, let me try and understand what stops you doing great work. And sometimes that may be a learning deficit, but often it's not. It's cultural, structural, organizational. And therefore, if you perceive that, you need to negotiate with the rest of the organization to get things done. In fact, it's almost impossible in my world to do anything in L&D that doesn't involve the rest of the organization, doesn't involve operations, talent management, you know, recruitment, development, um, whatever, onboarding. All of those things add up to making the life of an employee better, kinder, make their job easier to do. That should be the focus. You you deal with business issues, regardless whether you work for a charity or for, you know, for a massive company, you deal with the issues that stop good work and you try and encourage people to do their best and be their best. And in doing that, you build a better organisation. So the inward lookingness, do you think it's become that way? Um, you, you seem to be suggesting that technology had kind of made intensified that 
and maybe part of that is to bigger focus on content, um, which, which media plays a part in, of course. Has it become that way or was it ever thus? I mean, were training departments, su- did they suffer from the same kind of inward looking I think there was always, you know, and I'm, my own experience, a little bit of us against the world. You know, that when I was in the BBC, you know, the, I, I think probably the, the biggest fights we had were with the rest of HR, who saw us as a, as a, a kind of um, evil spawn of HR. <laughs> Uh, and I remember one senior person in HR saying, you know, Nigel, when will you ever understand that no one cares about your stupid courses? What they want are HR staff sitting with them, solving their problems. And in some ways, I, I kind of get that. But but it just illustrated that, that we had, you know, you had to build your credibility. And we, we used to build our credibility in, in the rest of the BBC rather than with HR and let, let our actions and activities speak for itself rather than try and justify ourselves. But, you know, you, you, in that feeling of being un, uh, oppressed and, and under attack, you, you huddle inward. And what we learned very, very quickly was the worst response was to hunker down. The best response was just to move out into the organisation. And, you know, I, I have two words which I, are very dear to me. And the first one is field work. And, and L&D does not do its field work. It, it believes what people tell them, and that's a terrible mistake, because what people tell you is what we need is. These people have a deficit in fix it, and often they don't know what they're talking about, uh, and everyone's an expert in learning because we all went to school, and the, the truth is that not everyone is an expert in learning, and they don't know what they sometimes don't know what they're talking about. So my belief is that that you've got to do your field work, and field work always involves getting out of the office, getting out of the the room and walking the talk, talking to people, exploring, questioning and saying, you think that's the problem? The problem is the lack of leadership. Can I go and talk to these people? I just need to understand the way they see the world. And of course, when you get there, you find that's absolutely not the not the issue. So that's my first word. The second one is practice. That not enough people in L&D see themselves as practitioners whose career is to improve and develop their practice. You know, I've consciously developed my practice. Uh, radically sometimes o- over the years, but not everyone sees that. And if you were an osteopath or a dentist or a doctor or an engineer, developing your practice would be second now. You wouldn't even think about it as an issue, a challenge. But, you know, I don't think that uh, there's enough people in L&D who consciously see themselves as practitioners and see their job as developing that practice. In the struggle against the forgetting curve that learning people are engaged in every day, there are no magic formulas, but there is science. For well over a century, psychologists have known that the spacing effect unlocks deep learning and helps learners power through to peak performance. And yet who uses it? Despite the fact that modern learning systems like LXPs make it almost easy. I've written a white paper with Learning Pool that shows how you can use the spacing effect to beat the forgetting curve. Download it now. The Learning Hack podcast is supported by Learning News, the learning sector's newswire. Rob and his team are good friends of the podcast, and we really value the help and advice we've had from them, and they do a great job. For the very latest news from around the learning sector, for interviews with learning leaders, the latest from learning sector vendors and features on workplace learning, go to learningnews.com. You also lament a too great focus on individual learning to the exclusion of organisational learning or the naive assumption that increasing the quantum of individual learning equals organisational learning. Correct. When you first raised that um, in our preliminary discussions, I didn't quite understand what you were getting at there. Can you unpack it a bit? I'll do my best. (laughs) Um, I I have an expression which is that learning happens in the space between people in a learning organisation. And most people think that I'm absolutely insane when I say things like that. But let me try and explain it. That, that if you concentrate on building people's individual skills profile, developing their individual competence, giving them 
individually AI selected content that will drive them forward. What you build is a, an organization of competent individuals or maybe excellent individuals, but you don't do anything for the organization as a whole. And the problem is that when those people leave, it's just a, a gulf, a canyon, a chasm opens up. In a learning organization, your role as an individual is to help others, to share your knowledge and learning, to work on problems together and collectively grow the organization so that if you leave, there's automatically uh, the gap is covered. So someone else steps in, some other group of people step in. The organization keeps going and keeps flourishing and you bring in people and you make them realize that it's the organization that supports them. The organization will guide their learning. And I have found that where you have those kinds of organizations that consciously focus on the learning organization, people stay because it creates a great environment, an environment where curiosity is, is there, that someone will help you if you have trouble, you will willingly help others if they're in trouble. Whereas where you focus on the individual, why would I help anyone if my focus is on my own individual success, my own competence, my own bonus or whatever it might be. And in those sorts of organizations, there's kind of conflict between individuals and there's very little sharing or willingness to share. I think you build toxic organizations as well as very, very frail organizations because they have no resilience. So if you want to build a resilient organization full of resilient people, you have to spend some of your time thinking about the nature of learning in the organization. I'm not saying that individual learning is irrelevant, far, far from it. But what I'm saying is that part of it has to be about the way knowledge floods through a learning organization, comes in from outside, permeates, taints, corrupts, um, it, like a virus infects the organization and the organization grows stronger as a result. Whereas when it's all individuals, no one cares. Why, why would I share that with them? I'm all right. I'm doing fine. And when I'm not doing fine in the organization, I'll go and find another one. And, and that's a kind of toxic, uh, toxic environment, I think. So I, a, a learning organizations really big news in the in, in the 2000s or late 90, 1990s mm. suddenly sunk without trace and and i just feel like i'm on a mission to bring that back and my next book is going to be on organizational learning because so i think it's really really important and the difference between an organization where learning th th hums and throbs around the organization and one where which has got a very strong cult of individual excellence the difference is manifest, I think, in what it's like to work there and how well those organizations can overcome all the brickbats that are being thrown at them. And, and there's an increasing amount of uh, issues, challenges being thrown as we move into this age of dis disruption, uncertainty and, uh, and, and inability to really predict what's going to happen in eight, eight months, six months, there alone six years. So I think it's very important, organizational learning. And if I keep going on and on about it enough, it may rub off on a few others and they'll give it a go. So I think it's fundamental. That's a very eloquent unpacking. Learning. On this subject, you've written, more learning is not the primary input. More learning occurs in any organisation when people feel empowered, get the organisation right, and learning follows. Could it not be um, objected that this is a bit of a council of despair for L&D? After all, they don't necessarily have the levers to affect organisational change at the strategic level, do they? I mean, they don't have the seat at the table and so on. So what does L&D on a kind of day-to-day -day level in terms of how it functions, how does it take that advice when it has kind of limits and parameters to its own operation? It's a good question. I'm sure a lot of people have seen me as a, as a killjoy and, uh, and someone preaching <laughs> a message of despair. It's actually quite the opposite. I think one thing follows to, follows to another, John, that, that I think if you are well aware 
of what stops learning being effective in an organization. That's not to do with individual intellectual ability or the, or the provision of resources. Learning fails for all sorts of reasons and very little of that is to do with learning. If you understand that profoundly and you understand what blockages exist in an organization that stops people doing good work, I think you've got a powerful message that you can take to that table and say, in order for us to do what we do, you have to take responsibility for this and this and this, or we can work together on solving these problems. And it was, it was when I was doing my learning culture book, you know, I realized that if there's no trust in an organization, you're never going to get a learning culture. You're never going to get people willingly sharing anything or admitting mistakes or being willing to help anyone else. So if you don't fix trust, nothing else falls into place. So I then began to work out um, the model of well, what are the constraints? And it, it is about autonomy, empowerment, uh, a sense of purpose. If you can drive these things, the learning almost looks after itself because people then are keen to learn, have a reason to learn and, and have the obstacles to learning taken away from them. Because it's still true that in many organizations, you put people through a program and the minute they get back into the workflow, they're told, shut up, that's rubbish. Why did you do that? We do it this way here. Sh sit down and get on with it. And you've, you've wasted that opportunity. It's certainly true in leadership development um, where most leadership development is, is disappeared without trace within two weeks. And it's cost a lot of money to boot. But it's true in everywhere that, that we don't live in vanilla. We don't live in theory. We live in a real world, which is messy, difficult, and you have to try to make it less messy and easier in order for the learning to embed. That's why I believe in learning should be in the flow of work, from the flow of work, to the flow of work. And if you lose that perspective, which you do when you just focus on, let's get this course out, let's give these people these skills. If you lose that connection with the flow of work, I think you lose your soul. You, you end up doing, doing stuff that has very little long-term impact. It looks good, people like it, of course they like it, but it doesn't really change fundamentally the way people behave and therefore fundamentally change the nature of the organization. And that's the big game. To me, that's the, the main game in town. And it's difficult. I, you know, I know I can tell you a thousand times where I've failed, where you can see what needs to be done and you just get blockages to the point where it's not going to happen. And then you have to gracefully retire. So it seems to me that what you're talking about here, the nub of, of the answer to that question is that it's in the conversations between L&D and the business. It's about talking to the business. I, mean, uh, it, I might be kind of focusing on that because I'm engaged in a project at the moment where we're talking to um, L&D practitioners, um, some of them at kind of early stages of their career, specifically about that thing of, of talking to the business and how L&D relates to the business. A, a word we hear quite a lot is pushback when it comes to that, that as well. How, how could you... What, what would you say, what advice would you give people in L&D for talking to the business in a good way? Yeah, you know, what, I, what I think is that if you can present or confront the organization with the reality of what it means to work in that organization, there may be pushback, but I think at that point you're dealing with toxic organizations that are do doomed to failure. Most organizations respond to the reality, the brutal reality. For example, you know, that if, if you want to make a case for leadership, just explain to the executive team the consequences of the dreadful leadership that's manifested. Explain about the people who fail. Explain about the misery. Explain about the people who leave. Give examples, categoric examples of things that happen as a direct result of those failures of leadership. And it, you'd have to be a pretty dim executive team not to say, we have to do something about this. So that's what stops pushback. When you confront people, not with solution, not saying, look, I've got this wonderful leadership program to present to you. Isn't it fantastic? And they say, how much does it cost? Oh, we can't afford that. Thanks very much. Next, next area for funding. If you confront people with 
sometimes the dreadful reality of working in your organization, of the bru brutal way that people are treated, of the way we expect them to work with one hand tied behind their back. You have to be pretty insensitive to not respond to that and say, well, so what can we do? And then you've got to have an answer, of course. In the moment that we're in now, where um, we have the great resignation, employment is, uh, I, I think I saw, was it Josh Burson mentioned this, was that employment in the US, unemployment in the US, is at the lowest rate since 1969, which I think is a startling statistic. Uh, when organizations are having to pay attention about how do we get people to stay? How do we get the right people to stay? How do we get the right people on board? Do you think there's a moment now where perhaps this becomes easy? Well, not perhaps easier, but, there, there, but there's more of an openness with organizations to listen to this message than perhaps going back, you know, 10, 20 years in the, the age of Enron and fairly toxic organizations. Yeah, I do. I, I honestly think that, that there's a lot of fear People see good people leaving, but there's also a truth, you know, that, and it, it's it, it's measured. You talk to Henry Stewart, and he's got the, he can quote um, chapter and verse. But what he says in happy organisations, the amount of attrition is a fraction of what it is in unhappy organisations. So if you want to keep people, build a happy organisation, build an organisation that respects individuals, build an organisation that focuses on communities and connection and creates peer group learning and um, where everyone feels that what we do we do as a team and what we achieve we achieve as a team and why would you leave when you when you're fundamentally happy uh, the people who leave are the ones who are fundamentally unhappy and think is this it is this what i've got to put up with for the next five years and that's why people are making kind of drastic decisions to change their life you know to say well i'll, I'll go to i'll go somewhere that i earn a third or two thirds of what I used to earn, but at least I'm doing good work, or at least I feel fulfilled. At least I, I'm not coming home absolutely brutalized at the end of each day. So yes, organizations where there has been massive turnover should look to themselves and ask what's going on. People will tell you, you know, they might say I'm going there because, you know, John Helmer, he pays me 20% more. The truth is they wouldn't even look at that if they weren't fundamentally unhappy and you get a bonus. Having said that, there are some, it, it, particularly in the States, some crazy stories of people doubling their salaries. And that's an offer very hard to refuse. But um, if you're really happy, you think twice about that. You know, I was just talking to someone two days ago saying, I, I love my organization. I'm being asked to, if I can double that, they're offering to double my salary. I just don't know what to do, Nigel, because I, I do really don't, I really don't want to leave. So, you know, I go through with, with that person and I'm saying, you have to explore the quality of your work and, and what the organization is like. And you have to have some hard conversations with your boss and the chief executive before you say yes. Do not step out of somewhere where you're happy to make yourself miserable for the sake of doubling your salary because you'll regret it within months. But if all things being equal, Go for it. It's a great opportunity. So there will be movement. There will be there will be churn, but uh, a lot of it is basically right down firmly and fairly and squarely at the responsibility of the organisations that are losing stuff. Who do nothing? You know, just think. Oh, I'll pay everyone five percent more. That won't do it. That won't cut it. It's not money. It's lifestyle. It's meaning. It, it's purpose. All of those things make people leave. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Isaac, who edits this and other members of the hack team, um, John Helmer doesn't necessarily pay any better than anybody else, <laughs> but we are a happy team. So lastly, Nigel, I feel we've only scratched the surface of your thinking experience and depth of achievement in learning. You've written the books, so those, those are there for people to go to. But if people want to know more, where would you point them in particular? Obviously, you're, you, you operate in a lot of different forums, but where would you particularly I like do, to yeah. Go? I, you know, I'm easy to find, you know, that yeah. you could track me. And uh, I, I express myself in all sorts of different ways, you know, in, in, in articles, in LinkedIn posts on the website. Um, so just just you can follow me on Twitter. There's all sorts of ways in which you can 
keep track with my um, emerging craziness uh, and um, stupid ideas. And some of them might strike a chord, some of them you might fundamentally disagree with. <clears throat> but I'm up for the debate. You know, that one, one of the things I quite like is uh, if you make, I suppose I do, pointed statements, other people are going to violently disagree with you. And that actually leads to a healthy debate. And I try to justify everything that I say. I don't make things up. I do look for evidence and I do do my own research so that, you know, I'm, I hope that if, if people gather around me, that they leave, even if they disagree with elements, they leave the better for it, just as I leave the better for working with people I don't 100% disagree with. You know, I've never tried to live in a bubble uh, where everyone nods sagely and agrees. And I think the best, one of the things I would advise people to do is go find the people who you don't agree with or you only agree partially with and see where they're coming from and where their points are. And maybe that will cause a transformation in your thinking. I've never thought I've got all the answers. <laughs> I've often thought I don't have any answers. But um, I, I believe that by talking to people, we'll get somewhere close. And that's, that's my message in life is, you know, just get somewhere close. But you need to do that by getting out of your comfort zone, by being curious, by asking questions, doing your field work and seeing yourself as a practitioner who's developing their practice. All of that stuff's important to me. Well, thank you, Nigel, for sharing your craziness and alleged stupid ideas with us today. It's, it's been a really great interview for me. I've really enjoyed that. I, I felt I understand a lot more what you're about. So thanks a lot for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure, John. Thank you very much indeed for giving me the time of day. It's been a pleasure. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and all our sponsors. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review, and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. Next time, you can find out how a maven of adaptive learning, Andy Wooler of Area 9, addresses Nigel's concerns about the drive to personalised learning. Until then... Stay curious, learning people.